Hey everybody, this is Kodok here, and boy oh boy, it has been a hot minute since I've been sent a nice, clean, attractive, promotional box like this. Uh, you might have noticed I was a little bit bitter that Battle Spirits didn't send me anything and I had to get my demo decks by winning a contest, but now we have been sent something by Elestrals. So, Elestrals is another Kickstarter game. It's been out for a little while, but they just had their like first big major official release. I do have some of the Kickstarter cards, but this is their first like broad introduction to set one. Now, before Alter dethroned it earlier this year, Elestrals was the single most successful Kickstarter trading card game out there. It was by a guy called A-Drive, who I know did a lot of Pokemon card game content, and A-Drive was actually the first person to talk to me about Jan Janssen, and he actually helped us um, at the Monster Crown Kickstarter get our problems with him all sorted out, so give him some thanks at least for that. As for Elastrols itself, I have used some of their promotional material in my videos, but I haven't actually talked about the game as a whole, although you can tell a lot about the game just from this box. You can see like the various cute little critters on here, the fact that the name is a portmanteau of elemental and astral should tell you a lot about that. So we have these sort of magical elemental creatures, um, but Elastrals, it's uh, sort of a hybrid of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, but the interesting thing about it, about it is that it actually uses a life point wagering system. This is a uh, resource system where your life points are also your resource. And the fascinating thing about life point wagering systems is I have never seen them done the same way twice. For example, you have Magi Nation, which has dream energy, which you use to play monsters and cast spells, but you get a little bit of that energy back at the start of each turn, so it's more of a stamina run than anything else. You have uh, Vampire the Masquerade, known now as Vampire Rivals, where you have your starting blood and you have to invest that blood into making new minions and taking locations, etc., etc., etc. There was Dinosaur King, which actually had it so that the stronger dinosaurs, if those were destroyed or defeated in battle, you took more life point damage. So it was more of a back end life point damage thing. Um, Elastrols is yet another example of life point wagering in a way that I don't think I've ever seen before. Um, what Elastrols does is you have these creatures called spirits. That's what these entities are on the front. And you have a deck of 20 of them, and you are allowed to build and spend this deck however you please. So what ratios you have of which spirit is entirely up to you, and how you invest them is as well. So it's not at all uncommon for you to say, splash in some thunder by having a couple of the Elastrals to benefit from some of the Thunder cards that are out there. I know that's a bit of a hot topic right now. But anyway, let us see what we got in this box. I do like how, I do like my large and substantial boxes, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but I do, I do save these boxes. Like, if I take a look to my right right now, I can still see that big green box that I was sent the Battle Claw stuff in. I save these, and this is going to be no different. This is, <laughs> now that I think about it, this looks like a card collector box, but like for the giant Pokemon cards, this looks like card, it's a, it's a giant card storage box is what this is. That's, that's kind of cool. Um, so if they ever put out a game that is made with giant cards, I'll be ready for them. So we have our elemental symbols here. Now, so far they have only released the five elements. I mean, I've, I've given people guff for doing this before. But the reason it really didn't work in Battle Spirits is because Battle Spirits had already been around for a while and only has six colors. This one has eight. And because it uses resource cards, it uh, in this case they are volatile resource cards in the form of the spirits because the whole point is you're trying to deplete all of your opponent's spirits. Um, there are eight of them and it can be a little difficult to accumulate that many that quickly, especially since I have yet to see anything to the equivalent of a land station for these online. Elastrols is, in my opinion, a game that would absolutely benefit from what I call a next logical step product. These are things like fat packs and elite trainer boxes, which contain the resources players need to really get started into a game. Um, but we currently have these five elements. We have earth, fire, wind, water, and heart. I mean, electricity. Um, and we have yet to see ice, 
light and dark. Um, those I believe are going to be introduced throughout the rest of the year. There's already, we've already gotten a glimpse of the ice spirit, which is like a little, a little, little ermine sort of creature. But I think we'll get a, a look at this as we open up. And of course we have our first edition symbol over here. The ones that most people have, have like a K on there. So let us have a look inside. Elastrol's first edition. Welcome to the mystical world of Elastrolls. Elastrolls was created as a passion project to recapture the magic of card games from my childhood and share that shame, same experience with my own children as well as all of you. Following our initial success on Kickstarter, Elastrolls First Edition is now available. As the creator of Elastrolls, I am thrilled to extend a warm token of our latest creation directly with you in this carefully crafted care package or CCCP, oh dear. You will find not only a testament to the world we have built, but also an appreciation of the content creator community that we come from. You have worked tirelessly to share yourself with the world, and I hope a small part of that journey, to be a small part of that journey by inviting you to share in this unboxing experience with your audience as a post, video, or live stream. Ellis Trolls is truly a special endeavor, and I encourage you to get involved. Thanks for supporting us. We appreciate your time, effort, and consideration as we strive to provide a lovable, interactive experience for years to come. Dan, a.k.a. A Drive, and the Ellis Trolls team. And you can see there, that's actually hand signs. That was certainly nice of them. On the back, we have our roadmap here. So yeah, we have the releases for the other elemental types, as well as something called lore. And I think I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So what we have in the box here, we have a booster pack of first edition. We have a couple of the special, uh, special, special uh, blister packs. So normally blister packs are made for sale. I kind of feel like they're just sort of a basic thing they make these days. But these contain Nectar of the Gods and Ambrosia, which are this game's pot of greed. And Ambrosia is basically, uh, you know, a life recovery. You pay one to get back two, basically. You go up two in life by playing Ambrosia. Um, and these are stellar versions of the cards. You can tell the card is a stellar version because it has the little shiny symbol next to it, like that Astrabid I showed off before was um, also one. Looks like we have a couple packs of Shattered Stars. I have opinions on Shattered Stars. A-Drive knows my opinion on Shattered Stars. Um, we also have the five Elastrolls deck and what looks like a playmat. Um, but it might be a Zeus playmat, which is good because I was planning on building an Imperial deck. And we have one additional game card, and it says it is Stellar Galaxia, which I assume is uh, this space whale guy here. So I assume this is a promo specifically for uh, promo 2023. So I, this might be, I'm not sure if this is a a promo specifically for us, but I'm guessing it's a stellar version of the whale. Now, stellar versions of cards are not different from the regular version of any card. They're just, you know, the rare chase varieties of it. They're essentially shiny Pokemon. And we have some sleeves here, which I believe are actually... Yeah, in two different colors. So you have one for your spirit deck and one for your regular deck. So your spirit deck and your regular deck should not mingle together. Um, I don't know if this has been changed, but we will have to see. Maybe we'll open up one of these packs right now and see what we can get. Because I'm wondering if they if they uh, change the backings of the spirit cards. Because honestly, that's something I would do. If your game has two different decks that are not meant to mingle, you should probably make it so that the that the uh, card backs are different so that they don't get accidentally stirred together. A lot of games have taken advantage of this by having cards that change when they get flipped over. A lot of leader cards are like that. Nectar of the Nectar of the Pringle Gods, more like. Um, I think this is just a, a side effect of, uh, of how these cards are are printed. Pringling is kind of to be expected, but I've heard that you can apparently like squish them between two cookie sheets and bake them out once you get the humidity set. So, Elastrals. I don't think I've seen this this uh, this pack art before. Ten additional game cards, so it's kind of like with Pokemon. Eons ago, gods and titans controlled the elements of creation. Now their powers have been set free from the stars. So I like to be kind of careful. I like to try to conserve these packs, which is why I don't usually slice them open with scissors. Although 
So I'm just doing a much worse. Yeah, that's that's not going to be saved at all. Maybe I should do this one with scissors. Or just do it the old-fashioned way, I guess. It's a tear pack. They're meant to be torn. So, Veritaqua. When Ver this Veritaqua enters battle with a defense position, Elestral, you can suppress that Elestral and destroy it. If you do, this Veritaqua deals no damage this battle. Okay, so... How battle works in this game is you do have attack position and defense position, and it works like Yu-Gi-Oh! However, the breakthrough system is a little bit different. Let's see if I got anything. There we go. So, what happens is you have to have this many spirits on an Elestral to keep it in play, and you can only put out one spirit each turn normally. There are ways to sort of cheat out more spirits, such as by nexusing. You can use, you can play a divine card, which allows you to pull a bunch of spirits out and essentially have them in play. And then you can nexus those in between those to get more onto your Elastral, but you're only allowed like one normal play each turn. But how Breakthrough works is when an Elastral defeats another Elastral, it does the difference in spirits between the Elastrals as damage. So the number of uh, spirits on the current Elastral and the number of spirits on the opposing Elastral. So if these two were at baseline, Barabog would be able to do one breakthrough damage by defeating Verutakwa. So, slightly different. You can't, like, barrier against things forever. Crack Kid, Ursmog, oh. Ursmog, P-Gust. When this P-Gust receives one or more, um, you can, you can target and destroy a rune. I believe that includes when it comes into play. Um, Electric, you may search for a divine rune, so that's like Zeus and all that. Barabog, when an opponent casts an is Elestral or rune without uh, without wood, without earth or water, they must expend. So expending, that's what it is. They must expend the difference in power, and your goal is to make it so that your opponent must expend a rune, but can't. So you have to mill their entire spirit deck, essentially. Titanostalk, you can expend um, earth, to force an opponent to play with their hand revealed until the end phase. Blazerus. Okay, I got a foil in my first pack at least. That's not bad. Viserus. This Viserus gets plus one for each Viserus on the field. When this Viserus destroys an Elestral in battle, you can special cast a Viserus from your hand or deck in defense position. So I'm guessing the idea is... Um, so you try to flood the field with these. I'm not sure how effective that is. I assume... This guy is meant to be more a gateway into summoning something larger. And we got a Zapter. Although, looking at this guy kind of reminds me of what I and a lot of people have said is probably Elestral's biggest weakness. And that is that it is struggling to find an identity outside of the game. Now, I've seen the game. I've seen it played. They've actually already had a big Elestral's tournament where people have played the game and shown it off. But... The problem is there isn't really much out of Elestral since he does a, Yeah, they do still have the same card back. I kind of wish that the spirits had a different card back so that you didn't accidentally get them all shuffled together. Um, but the problem is um, Elestral is struggling to have an identity outside of being a game. Because he talks about, you know, the love of childhood and stuff like that. And um, there are some cool things about that. But I haven't really found much in this game that is for kids. I mean, when Pokemon came out, it was a new thing, but these days, collectible monster games are a dime a dozen, and you really have to do something to make it stand out. Um, I went online and looked at the lore, so the lore is basically the Titanomachy. That is literally the, the Greek story of the Titanomachy, where the Titans and the gods did battle, and so the, um, the various characters you have, so the divine runes that are mentioned by Electric are actually the Greek gods. You have Zeus and Demeter and Poseidon and all of them. I assume we're going to see more based on the, the ice, light, and dark characters. Um, so right now, this game is Pokemon with a toga, pretty much. It has, um, it has a Greek um, flavor to it, but I, I'm not really sure how much it does to stand out. Like, apparently this takes place in a, a land called Elestria, but we haven't really learned anything about it. Now, according to the rule book, the reason that we are playing these spirit games of Elestrals is because we are a chosen mortal seeking immortality. That's something, 
but that doesn't really tell me much about the world itself. Is it like We Cross, where it's sort of a something done in secret? Is it like Highlander? Is it like Zatch Bell? There are lots of these sorts of Contest of Champions series, but I really don't have a feel for how this is supposed to go down. Now, a few days ago, they did release basically the first chapter of an audiobook. It is so far like their least popular video by far. It's been out for nine days and yet it only has like 1200 views, which tells us a little bit about what's going on. It's about a boy who apparently grew up in the woods and is raised by Ellis Strolls um, having their first ever encounter with other humans. And you know, that's kind of neat. But looking at the roadmap they handed me, it looks like they're only going to do a new chapter of this audiobook once every three months, and that really is not going to be enough. Because uh, it's one of the reasons I praised Alpha Clash is, you know, it's a game that's inspired by comic book superheroes, so what is one of the things that they put out immediately and are actually working on making another one of? a comic book. They're putting out comic books based on the characters for Alpha Clash. I really hope that Elastral's gets kind of the same treatment. This is Elastral's big struggle, and that is finding its identity. I am not the only person that the concept of Elastral's as like a greater story, as like a world, hasn't really clicked with, and this is probably the biggest reason. But I feel like there's not much for the Timmy or the Vorthos to peruse as far as um, identity goes. Now, Timmy's, I'm a Timmy. I will openly admit that I am a Timmy player. Um, Timmy's like spectacle. They like things that they can collect and really get into. Vorthos are even more about lore than Timmy's are. Like, I'm, I'm the kind of person who is convinced that Vorthos is just a flavor of Timmy. Um, but I go on the website and I click on the lore section, but I don't really learn anything about these characters. They're the Elestrals, their behaviors, what they do, their habitats or anything like that. Like all I know about Zapter is that there are apparently nine different printings of it. Um, but that doesn't really tell me what this character is. What does it do? Where does it live? What does it eat? You know, things like that. They have an entry for data, but right now it just says Zapter is a is a thunder spirit, pretty much. You could have habitat information there. You could talk about how it runs across the desert seeking lightning and it eats glass because that's what happens when lightning strikes sand or something like that. I don't know. Um, like I said, that's what I think is kind of the weakness there. If you're trying to make something collectible, um, especially for like a collectible game or something like that, you really do need to generate that kind of presence, that kind of identity. And I really don't think a chapter of an audiobook every three months is really gonna cut it. So, going back to the gameplay. So, in your game, your life total is determined by your 20 card spirit deck. And this is one that you can build however many you want. You can include whatever spirits you want. You don't have to shuffle it, it's not randomized. When you spend cards out of the spirit deck, you may spend it however you please. So, basically, you build your investment portfolio before the game even starts. Now, to actually play the game, you can only invest one of these spirits to play an Elestral once per turn. You can use it to play a new Elestral from your hand, in which case you put the spirit down on one of your four Elestral zones and then place your Elestral on top of it. You can use it to level up an Elestral. I believe they call it an Ascension by playing another, attaching another energy to an Elestral and then sending the old Elestral to the discard pile to put down the new Elestral, who can be paid for with this new spirit cost. This is how you get out your level two, your level three spirit Elestrals. And like Yu-Gi-Oh, it is very boss monster centric. Like you're looking at the major decks and they're built around the big monsters like Pen Terror and Vol Tempest. Um, ironically enough, those are actually the box toppers for the Kickstarter edition and the first edition are those two, and those, I believe, are the, the, the decks to beat right now, if I recall correctly. Um, or you can, um, just attach an energy, attach a spirit to an Elestral and do nothing. Um, this is called enchanting an Elestral, and there are Elestrals that gain effects when enchanted, and that includes when it's played for the first time. Um, or you can spend that spirit to draw a card. So there's always a way to spend a life point 
out of your deck, although I'm pretty sure most people are going to be using it to do the enchant an Elestral to bring a new one into play. Um, the thing that breaks the rules are the runes. So you have your four Elestral slots, you also have four rune slots, which you can use to play runes. And you can play as many runes as you want, paying their cost out of your life total accordingly. And it's leveraging these runes that allow you to sort of cheat more cards into play. Because obviously a game where you can only cheat one spirit out each turn doesn't sound too appealing, especially if your opponent gets out a big boss monster and starts squashing you, how are you going to catch back up? So these other cards are basically how you wiggle the characters out. There are the divine runes, which allow you to basically extract a bunch of spirit cards from your deck to invest and nexus around. They are very good as a result. Um, there are Elestrals that allow you to maneuver these a bit. There are a bunch of cards that allow you to nexus these cards for an effect. There are ones that allow you to heal yourself. For example, I am building a mono-electric Imperial deck, and its base form Quackle allows you to... It basically has the same effect as Ambrosia, which allows you to return cards to your life deck. Um, the only difference is that I'd have to spend my normal summon to get Quackle out, and there might be other things I'd want to do. Um, you don't actually have to go Quackle into Imperial. It's it's like it's like Pokemon in that you basically have to level up your characters, but like Digimon, it doesn't have to be a straight line. Now there are some Elestrals that benefit from taking the path of the straight line, but not all of them do. As long as the spirits match what you want to do, you can level up to that Elestral, and you can actually take spirits from other Elestrals in order to ascend an Elestral. So if I have two Elestrals in play at one spirit, I can spend my spirit for the turn to attach a spirit to one of them and then move it from the other Elestral to bring it into play. But if the Elestral doesn't have enough spirits to stay in play, then it doesn't stay in play. And you don't even have to use the matching spirits. Um, you can use technically any spirit to enchant an Elestral, but it loses all of its card text. So there are a lot of ups and downs. All of the different attributes, they have things like deck searches and destruction and ways to cheat things into or out of play. So there is a lot of depth to the gameplay design. There's definitely a lot going on here. And like I said, I don't think I've seen a life point wagering system like this. And it's not really like life point wagering. It's more like a life point portfolio, like I said before. Um, so you build your life point portfolio to play your cards with. And it's really about tempo is how a lot of these games are, is how wisely do you invest your life points. It's possible to overextend. I actually I actually like games where there is the risk of overextending yourself, which an opponent can punish if they do it correctly. Um, I like games where you can make genuinely bad decisions and have to pay for that. And that I think is probably Elastral's biggest strength, is that as far as the game is concerned, I do think that there is a lot going on and a lot of interesting stuff. Sometimes it can be a little bit hard for an element to feel an identity because a lot of them have cards that are kind of samey. Like all of the attributes have a card that let you Nexus 2 in order to do some kind of effect. Um, like I said, it is also very boss monster centric. I do worry that it might be difficult for some decks to wriggle their way out of a bad situation. Like if somebody gets a Pen Terror out and you just don't have anything on your field that can stop it, there's really not much you can do about that without some kind of destruction effect. And Pen Terror is specifically a card that punishes destruction effects. So there are a lot of situations in this game that can get real scary real fast. As for how the cards are distributed, the starter decks, which do contain some exclusive cards, and there is one starter deck per attribute, although it's not like 100% that attribute. They have some cards of other attributes mixed in. It is, uh, there are some exclusive cards in there, although you can pretty much get play sets of all of them by just buying two starter decks, so I think that's fine. In fact, in a lot of cases, specifically the Divines, you actually get one extra copy if you buy two copies of the deck. So not a bad thing at all, should not be too hard to get those things into distribution. But looking at these starter decks, yeah, the box design, they are a bit samey and dull. I get the idea is to sort of make them look like they're unified, but from the same game. But as a result, they kind of struggle to stand out from each other, especially Water, Wind, and Fire, oddly enough. I mean, Imperial looks great, it's nice striking yellow, works really well against the color scheme of the box. 
but the others are a little more difficult to tell apart. Like the wind, water, and fire ones look kind of similar, which is really weird for fire because the grass one with its bright orange, the wood themed one with its bright orange looks a lot more like the fire deck than the actual fire deck. Personally, I would have maybe had these decks rather than all having the same sort of the same sort of blue and purple I might have had them all have like the main color and the follow-up color like the the two most common colors in the deck as the box's color scheme so that they are visually distinct from one another the booster boxes come with 36 packs and each pack contains 10 cards which I think is a little excessive for a set whose size is a net 107 because I am not going to include the spirits because they're basically basic energy cards or the alternative art cards in that number. So going by my old formula, the pack size probably should have been more like seven. Instead, it's 10. But either way, be prepared for a lot of chaff. Also, I just noticed this, but it has the Elastrals thing here upside down on the back of the box that when you fold it over on the flap, it's right side up when you look at it from behind. Neat. There are sleeves and binders, but so far there does not to seem to be anything resembling a next logical step, as I like to call it. Um, an ETB would probably do this game tremendously good. An ETB that comes with some booster packs, maybe sleeves, and of course a big chonking set of spirits that can be used in the decks, I think is something everybody would want and would honestly be the product I would propose adding. That and a comic book. And other things on top of that, you know, the, the sorts of things like this is about recreating that childhood wonder, lean into that a bit more. Have like coloring pages. You have like the base line art for like the spirits and stuff like that, right? Get out some black and white ones that kids can color on. If you feel particularly ambitious, you could easily adapt something with like an MS Paint program. Like I said, each card should have a description of what the character is like, its species, its habitat, what it eats, what it does, those sorts of things that really get people to, you know, hang around on the website and just explore for ages, I think would go a long way to really generating that childhood experience you want. But then there's Shattered Stars. Shattered Stars is sort of a subscription booster pack, and I can't say I'm, I'm really not a fan of that, because the idea that you have to subscribe to get special booster packs once every once in a while, it, it, it rubs me the wrong way, honestly. I mean, I know people get booster packs. Um, the idea that it could be like an online exclusive or something I think would work better, but then I learned a little bit more about it, and my opinion has changed in sort of two different directions. So it turns out each of these Shattered Star packs is based on one of the basic elements and contain the same six common cards. Okay, that's fine. So it's a bit like a secret layer and one of five random rares. And that is where I think this idea crosses the line. The idea is, it, it, it sort of feels like by making it so that you get one of five random rares, they're kind of lifting the cap on how many you can buy to try to enforce FOMO. Here's the thing. If it didn't have that feature, I honestly think this might not be a bad idea. The idea is that they are packs of basic cards with fun alternative art on it. You know, maybe like a miniature secret layer, and that would be cool. You could subscribe to one to just get the alternative arts, or subscribe to three to get full play sets of alternative arts. I think that might actually be a, a fun thing to do, but by adding the randomized rares, especially since it's one of five, especially since some of those rares are, you know, cards that are found in regular starter decks at, like, common, I think maybe isn't as cut and dry as it really ought to be. So I still don't like this as an idea. I honestly think that the time limitation would be more than enough to incentivize people to buy in at one or three per uh, subscription. So that's my thoughts on it. And so that's my thoughts on Elestrals. A big thanks uh, again to them and A-Drive for giving me the chance to go over it. And like I said, while I think the gameplay itself is absolutely solid, I love the idea of building sort of a life point portfolio and knowing how to properly invest it and at what time to get things together. Kind of, it, it actually like genuinely combines like the experiences of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. I talk about how it's um, about how Pokemon is about investment and Yu-Gi-Oh is about preparation. This involves it genuinely like melds those experiences together on more than just a surface level. 
and I think that is absolutely commendable. Like I said, the one thing that I feel Elistral's needs is a step or two in a more wholesome direction. I want them to like go to the website, like just spend a weekend cranking out the lore of all of these neat critters. Give me something to peruse when I'm not playing the game or cracking packs, you know? Let me know who these characters are, tell me stories, make coloring pages. A lot of these things don't really take much effort at all. That's kind of what I think it needs to do. Same with the, the Shattered Stars, figure out how to make it, you know, just kind of a nice thing that people can look forward to and invest in rather than something that invokes FOMO. Go in those directions and I think you'll actually have something good going on with Ellis Rules. That said, thanks again A Drive. Thanks again for your help with Monster Crown and all of that. Like I said, just give just give him props just for being helpful in that regard. I do hope that we see a brighter future for Ellis Rules. One that I think will actually work a lot more if it leans more heavily into the idea that it's the kind of card games we would play when we were children. So yeah, that is Ellis Trolls, and until next time, this is Kodak signing off.